I'm back. Mr. Clark's back. Time to take a look at 17.4 as we look at new forces in Asia, in China, in Japan. Some of the key objectives we'll look at are the challenges faced by the Chinese Republic in the early 1900s. We'll analyze the struggle between nationalist and communist in China. We'll summarize the impact of liberal changes in Japan in the 1920s. Look at the rise of extreme nationalism and militarism in Japan, kind of foreshadowing to a much more aggressive Japan in the middle of the 1900s. We'll describe the impact of the Japanese invasion of China. As we go through, kind of look at each question, and as I go through them, kind of think about your own responses. Who is the father of modern China? There's three principles of the people that he believed would help modernize China. You can see Sun Yat-sen there. And sometimes uh, his name is spelled a little bit differently. There's some alternative way to, ways to spell some of the Chinese leaders we'll be looking at today. So Sun Yat-sen, he believed in nationalism, democracy, and economic security for everyone. What did the great Chinese general Yan Shikai attempt to do in 1912 as he took power? He attempted to reestablish a dynasty rather than modernize. And obviously the, the fair-minded people within society are not going to necessarily be very happy about that. Th uh, three, what happened in China in 1916 after Yan died? China fell into a deep depression. Economically, they were struggling. Also, we saw the emergence of local warlords. These are people who controlled not the entire country, but large regions within China, and they kind of controlled the distribution of necessities, you know, food, water, security, things like that. Question four, list the three major causes of upheaval or unhappiness in, in the Chinese Republic. Well, obviously this warlord situation is not necessarily going to be something anybody's going to embrace. So you saw disorder in the provinces, rival armies battling for control. Millions of the peasant class were really suffering. You had foreign imperialism, as we had looked at earlier the spheres of influence as Western countries began to carve up parts of China. They kind of forced trade on China, including opium. In addition to that, we saw the failed Boxer Rebellion, and we saw the loss of China versus Japan in the first Sino-Japanese War. Uh, foreign merchants were dominating the ports. They had the 21 demands. Japan was gaining possession of some of the formal, former Chinese holdings. There was social unrest. We had the May 4th movement. We had the revolutionary Marxist or communist ideas or ideology beginning to spread. The Soviet Union was training students and military officers to become the vanguard of the communist revolution. These are all things we'll kind of hit on as we move uh, throughout the history of China in the 1900s. And we'll be looking at some of those as early as question number five here. When we look at number five, why did China give in to some of the 21 demands? China lacked a leader to kind of unify the country from a political and military standpoint. It was a little bit too weak to resist. Six, how do warlord uprisings and foreign imperialism lead to the May 4th movement? Warlord uprisings weakened China, allowing countries such as Japan to in approach upon China's possessions, meaning began to take or gobble up. Anger at China's inability to halt foreign imperialism led to the May 4th movement. We think logically about who might know best in terms of what other countries are doing and how they could better modernize and kind of westernize. And because of that, we saw a lot of the college age students lead the protest in China. Other periods of time in history, even in American history, we'll see college age students lead a lot of the different protests for civil rights, for uh, opposition to the Vietnam War and things like that. So you always see the uh, young people, not much older than many of you, who are really like the core of 
I guess, speaking out for what is right. Sometimes you get the older folk who are just kind of content with life or unwilling to step up. So mostly college students protested in Beijing for modern laws and industry. You can see some of the imagery and paintings down below. Since they were better educated, they knew more about the modern world. And they basically have a painting, an image, and an engraving or carving that kind of commemorates the movements of the young Chinese during this period of time. Dissatisfied with conditions in China in 1919, whose teachings and philosophies did many Chinese turn to? Many of you might have thought Confucius, but no, they went towards some of the communist philosophies of Vladimir Lenin, the new communist leader in Russia, and Karl Marx, kind of the founder with his book, The Communist Manifesto in 1848, the founder of the um, communist movement. He also looked to the Russian Revolution as a model of success. And by the 1920s, communism was gaining a lot of momentum, getting the big mo in China. Nine. Who were the Guomindang in China? This is the Nationalist Party led by Sun Yat-sen. Established a government in South China. Who took control of the Nationalist Party in China after Sun Yat-sen's death in 1925? This is someone that's going to come into the forefront in terms of our discussions. Uh, Chiang Kai-shek. In 1925, an energetic young officer, Zhang Ji, and better known as Chiang Kai-shek. As I mentioned before, we have alternative spellings and ways to kind of look at these Chinese leaders. They took uh, Chiang Kai-shek to control the Nationalist Party. 11, who, who was defeated during their northern expedition? Why was this significant? We'll see at different points in history, even though they're going to be in opposition to each other, the Chinese Nationalist Party and Communists will be in opposition and ultimately fight in a basically civil war or revolutionary war in China. But in this case here, they join forces to knock out and defeat the local warlords. Sometimes you put the interest of the country at large over your individual political interests. In some ways, it's kind of like Democrats and Republicans coming together and, and taking care of America first, opposed to their own political interests. This was significant because it was an important step towards the unification of China. Another significant figure in Chinese history will emerge here as we look at number 12, who emerged as the leader of the Communist Party in China, Mao Zedong. You can see the Communist Chinese flag behind Mao Zedong in the photo on the left. On the right side, there's a portrait. Many Chinese would have portraits like that hanging in their homes at one point in time in the middle, eight, middle 1900s. 13, explain the events that are remembered as the Long March in China. This is an attempt to eliminate what was left of the Communist Party in 1934. Chiang Kai-shek had all known communists rounded up. Roughly 100,000 communists were forced to march 6,000 miles. That's almost the equivalency of walking to California and back to New Jersey. A round trip. It was around 3,000 miles out to California, 3,000 miles back. And that's how long these guys, uh, these uh, com communists were forced to March a lot of it was like winding mountain roads, which added to the distance. Very difficult terrain. About 80% of all Chinese communists died during this initial long march. Rather than kill off the Communist Party, Chinese peasants who have been abused by nationalists welcomed the communists because they were polite, treated them with fairly, with some degree of respect. The long march became a symbol of communist heroism and Mao Zedong's support actually grew amongst the rural population. Let's take a look at the Long March. Got a couple different maps there. One on the left-hand side kind of gives you the route. And it shows kind of this winding route. And you're going through a wide degree of mountains. We see the Yangtze River, the Great Snow Mountains grasslands. So really a very difficult set of terrains there with rivers and mountains to navigate. 16, the leader of a faction within the nationalists kidnapped Chiang Kai-shek and held him until he agreed to ally with the communists against Japan. Why would this leader take such a drastic step? 
Chiang Kai-shek was focused on exterminating the immediate threat to his power, the communists, rather than the Japanese invasion that was taking place in the 1930s. The kidnapper wanted to persuade him to act in the good of all Chinese citizens. A very dramatic and sad event in Chinese history, which kind of unified the country against Japan, which is the rape of Nanjing. This is the destruction and cruelty, cruelty perpetrated by the Japanese army after taking Nanjing, China in 1937. You can see here they're killing, basically, just basically murdering Chinese and intimidating young people, women, children. So Marxism was the was based on the rise of the proletariat or industrial working class. How is Chinese communism different from classic Marxism? China only had a small urban working class because they weren't very modern, so they weren't necessarily being abused in the factories like a lot of the people in Western Europe. Mao Zedong believed that the peasants could be the heart of China's revolution, similar to the working classes during Russia's 1918 revolution. 19, we kind of focus more on Japan now. What were some sources of unrest in Japan during the 1920s? Well, they were much more successful from an industrial and a developmental standpoint than China during this period of time. Rural peasants and factory workers, however, remained very poor. Young people, very similar to the May 4th movement in China, revolted against tradition in favor of more Western ideas. Military leaders condemned political and business corruption and Western influence. The economy fluctuated quite a bit with going through a series of ups and downs. 20, how did Japan grow into a major economic and imperial power during and immediately after the First World War? Japan annexed Korea in 1910. They sought further rights in China with the 21 demands. Japan was awarded former German possessions in East Asia by the Allies at the 1919 Paris Peace Conference, all of which contributed to a movement towards more modern Japan. 21, why did Japan want to expand its territories during and after World War I? When we think about Japan geographically, it's an island nation formed out of like rocky soil and the hoarding of the soil. So not necessarily the most fertile in terms of resources, it's also a very densely or heavily populated country. It was a small island nation that lacked the natural resources to fuel its industrial achievement, including things like oil and steel and iron and all the different building blocks of um, a more modern country. 22, what were some of the reasons for the ultra-nationalist discontent during the 1930s? They condemned politicians for halting overseas expansion. They resented the racial policies of other nations who shut out immigrants. They pointed to the worsening economic crisis as a justification for renewed expansion. Summarize the causes and effects of the Manchurian incident. A group of Japanese army officers pretended that the Chinese had attacked the Japanese owned railroad line in the Chinese province of Manchuria. The Japanese army claimed that self defense and attack Manchuria. Army leaders then set up a puppet state. What they did is they fabricated an incident to justify going into Manchuria, a region of China, and taking control. That was really the first aggressive step of the Japanese prior to the start of World War II. It's also a sign that they were going to be aggressive. They were condemned by the League of Nations, and then they withdrew from the League of Nations because they didn't feel like they wanted to be scolded by the League of Nations. 24, what did militarists and ultranationalists, why did militarists and ultranationalists glorify Hirohito and encourage the revival of traditional values? Hirohito is going to emerge as the leader in Japan. In Japanese tr tradition, Hirohito was seen as a living god and a supreme authority. Traditional warrior values were promoted and victorious Japanese history was celebrated. They used Hirohito as a symbol of a Japanese nation which was powerful to encourage obedience and service to both the emperor Hirohito and the nation. 25. How did the government react to the demands of ultra-nationalists? Crack down on socialists, suppress the most democratic freedoms, 
revived ancient warrior values, built a cult around Emperor Hirohito, and used schools to teach students obedience and service to the state. It's a pretty long-winded one sentence there for you. You can kind of maybe bullet those out for a little bit shorten the response. But a six, what is one example of Japan's continued refusal to cooperate internationally? What is one example of Japan's continued course of expansion during the 1930s? The government nullified its agreement to limit the size of its navy, and Japan attacked China a second time in 1937, starting the Second Sino-Japanese War. Japan linked together in a triple partite pact with Germany and Italy after World War II broke out, becoming a member of the Axis powers. To reflect on how did the Asian powers of Japan and China develop similarly during the 1700s through the 1900s, which nation adjusted best? And so based on this discussion here, hopefully you have a clear understanding of which country adjusted best. Japan and Japan, uh, Japan and China developed in isolation from Western countries for centuries as they tried to maintain their homogeneous society. They didn't want to trade or travel with other countries. During the middle 1800s, Western nations began to gain influence in both countries. Both nations were forced to accept the open door policy with Western countries. However, Japan modernized first and even, and even despite its smaller size was much more powerful during most of the 1900s. Hopefully you enjoyed our look here at China and Japan as we look at the 20th century emergence of these two countries. Until next time, Mr. Clark is out.